Welcome back to Learn Software Defined Radio. I'm Prof. Jason at Harvey Mudd. Today, we're going to talk about complex numbers in Software Defined Radio. And it's one of the harder things to wrap your head around when you first start, because right away, you plunk down a receiver and complex numbers come out. And you need to know what they mean and how to deal with them. So I'm just going to go over some very basic complex number math and uh, graphical interpretations of complex numbers, adding, subtracting, multiplying complex numbers, and then complex sinusoids. That's those are the relevant things for, for software defined radio. So let me first draw a real and an imaginary axis, because this is probably the best way to visualize complex numbers. A real axis I'll draw in blue, and in an imaginary axis, I'll draw in red. That's how GNU Radio by default tends to plot things. And these are just like the X and Y Cartesian axes. So one, two, three, four, five. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. One imaginary unit, I, two I, three I, four I, negative I, negative two I, negative three I, negative four I. And if you have a complex number like two plus one I, let me just plot that here. So a number here would be something like two, two plus one i. You can think of that as a point in the complex plane, or you could also think about it as a, uh, a little arrow here. And thinking about it as a little arrow, like a vector, is going to be useful for addition. So for example, if we add two complex numbers, two plus one i and one plus three i, to add these numbers, you just add their real parts and you add their imaginary parts, and that will give you the result. And graphically, you can think about that as adding uh, this vector here, two plus one i, with the vector one plus three i, so one over and one, two, three up. And that will give you the final complex number, three plus four i. And you can think of this new number as an arrow that points from the origin. So adding and subtracting complex numbers is easy. It's done component-wise. And to add and subtract complex numbers on a computer, there are two addition operations, one for the real part and one for the complex part. And this is how complex numbers are, are, uh, are managed on, on the computer. And when your software-defined radio spits out a sequence of complex numbers, any mathematical operations happen in this real and imaginary Cartesian, uh, Cartesian basis here. So you can think of addition as translation, right? I'm, when I'm adding, I'm translating numbers around this plane. The more interesting thing that we're going to spend much more time on is multiplication. So multiplication of complex numbers, the, the way the computer does it and the way that you might first uh, do it by hand is to go component by component. So if you have a complex number a plus i times b, and you're multiplying that by x plus i y, you just have to multiply out like, like you learned in math class. And I'm going to group it in a way that the first term is going to be the real part. So uh, I get a times x. And the other real number is ib times iy. Remember, the definition of this imaginary unit is that i is the square root of minus 1. So i squared is minus 1. So ib times iy is going to give me minus 1 by. And I'm going to add to that the other two uh, multiplies here. So i times a y, the outer one, and i times b x as the inner one. So to multiply complex numbers, you just go component by component. And in terms of components, there need to be four real multiplies and one addition and one subtraction. And uh, that's, that's how the computer 
does complex multiplies. But for visualizing what complex multiplies are all about, it's much better to think in terms of polar coordinates. So let me draw a number on this Cartesian two-dimensional plot here. I'm going to label it with polar coordinates. So imagine I had some, some number that was over here. And you could think about this as a, an arrow that goes out to that number. The arrow has some length, which we'll call the magnitude of the number, r, and some angle from the real axis, which we call phi. And we can drop down uh, lines that go to the real and the imaginary axis. And just using standard trigonometry, the real part of this number is going to be r cosine phi. And the imaginary part is going to be r sine phi. And this angle phi can, can be 0. It can be 90 degrees. Then you have a pure imaginary number. 180 degrees, you'd have a pure negative number. Uh, 270 degrees, you'd have a negative imaginary number all the way around. And since sine and cosine uh, are, are functions that, that give both positive and negative numbers, this works for any number anywhere in this complex plane. And so the way you would write this number, you'd write this complex number, let me call this z. You write this complex number z as its real part, r cos phi plus i times its imaginary part, r sine phi. And let me factor out the r here and just get cos phi plus i sine phi. And if you haven't seen this yet, I'm going to use Euler's equation. So the, the result I'm going to get here is r times e to the i phi. So this is just e, the standard number that shows up in natural logarithms. And if you've never seen this before, the easiest way to convince yourself that this might work, if you've taken calculus, is to write the Taylor expansion of e to the x and the Taylor expansion of cosine and the Taylor expansion of sine and see that when you uh, plug in i phi here, all of the real numbers group together to give you the Taylor expansion of cosine and all the odd powers which give you imaginary numbers grouped together to give you the Taylor expansion for sine. So this is one way of, of convincing yourself that this works. But what's nice about this is it makes multiplication very easy. So instead of thinking about multiplication component by component, where there's very little intuition as to what's going on, multiplying two numbers in this form is a lot simpler and a lot simpler to think about. So let me write an example of that over here. So if I have two complex numbers, let's call the first one r1 e to the i phi 1, and the second one r2 e to the i phi 2. The result is just multiplying the magnitudes together, r1, r2, and multiplying these complex phase factors together. But since these phi's are in the exponent, they just add. So this just gives me e to the i phi 1 plus phi 2. And the geometric interpretation is very straightforward here. So the magnitude of the new complex number is just the product of the magnitudes of the old complex numbers. And the phase of the new complex number is just the sum of the phases of the old number. So imagine if I were to multiply some arbitrary complex number by a pure phase. So a, a number whose magnitude, whose, whose r2 is just 1. If, if r2 was just 1, and I'm multiplying by what's called a pure phase, then the magnitude of the new number doesn't change, but the angle of the number moves over by the, the phase that I, uh, that I multiply. So the interpretation of multiplication is a scaling by the magnitudes and a rotation by an amount that's equal to the, the, uh, the phase that I'm multiplying by. But if in my complex plane, I have a number that's small and at some small angle by one, and another number whose 
a little bit bigger, is at some other angle, phi two, the product of these two numbers is gonna be the product of these two magnitudes, which might be larger, and it's gonna be at an angle that's the sum of phi one plus phi two. So you can use complex multiplication to rotate around in the complex plane. All right, so the way we're gonna use this is, uh, is usually with signals that aren't just static, they aren't just single numbers, but they're signals that are functions of time or samples in time. And the simplest one to look at is just a pure e to the i phi. And let me, let me write what that looks like. All right, so what I want to plot is I want to plot e to the i times two pi some frequency times time. And I'm going to use Euler's formula. I'm going to write that as a real part, which is cosine of two pi times some frequency times some time plus i times the imaginary part, sine two pi frequency time. All right, so what does this look like on a plot as a function of time? Uh, as a function of time, the real part in blue is gonna look like a cosine. So it's gonna start at one and cross zero, go down to negative one, and go up to positive one. And the peak to peak time here, the time to go from peak to peak, is gonna be one over the frequency f. So this is a real honest frequency in Hertz. The imaginary part is the sine version of this and sine starts at zero and peaks when the cosine hits zero. So it'll peak here. It'll cross zero when the cosine is at a minimum and go to negative one when the cosine is uh, crosses zero again. So the sine part will look something like this. And let me just label these for, for clarity here. So this one is um, cosine two pi f t in blue and sine of two pi f t in red. And this is for um, a function of time that varies periodically. So there are two ways of applying this. One is to plot the real and imaginary parts in blue and red. And the other way is to plot the number on the Cartesian plane as a function of time. So at t equals zero, this is e to the i zero, that's cosine of zero, which is one, and sine of zero, which is zero. So the, this number starts off here, and then after a little time goes by, the real part goes down and the imaginary part goes up. So the next time step would be somewhere up here. And the next time step would be up here. The next time step would be up here. And as time goes on, so we'll make a circle. Well, I'm not drawing a great circle because I didn't give myself a lot of room here. This would make a circle around the origin with always uh, a unit distance from the origin. So as a function of time, you would go around the circle. So there are two different ways of plotting complex numbers and, and GNU radio can do both. So when I use the signal generator, I looked at, at this way where I was plotting, plotting what the software defined radio returned. And it looked a lot like this. It looked like a cosine component and a sine component. And the other, the other way of plotting it is to plot it on the complex plane. This is called a constellation plot for reasons that will become clear later when we start sending digital data. Now, let me plot the opposite, which, which will also be relevant. And that is negative 
uh, negative frequency. So this pattern here of cosine and sine and going around the complex plane in a positive direction, that applies when the frequency is positive, when f is positive. If f is negative, then the plot looks a little bit different. So negative frequency, negative f, Well, cosine is an even function. So cosine of negative something is the same as cosine of that thing. So the, the real part, the cosine part doesn't change. That'll still start at one and cross zero. But sine of a negative number is negative the sine of that number. So the imaginary part flips sine. So instead of starting at zero and going up, the the imaginary part's going to start at zero and go down. And it will reach its minimum when cosine is zero. It'll cross zero when cosine reach, has its minimum and uh, reach its maximum there. Cross zero. So here, the cosine peaks first and then the sine. Here, the sine will peak first, or the negative sine will peak first, and then the, the cosine. So you can tell the difference between a positive frequency and a negative frequency uh, by looking at the order of, of the real and the imaginary parts. So remember, blue is always the real part, and red is going to be the imaginary part. And in the complex plane, what does a negative frequency look like? Well, as a function of time, it starts off at still e to the i zero at time equals zero. But now the real part's gonna shrink, the imaginary part's gonna get negative. So as the real part shrinks, the imaginary part gets negative, it'll end up circling around in the opposite direction. And I'm, we tend to work with discrete samples here. So I'm drawing a series of discrete samples, but as a continuous function, this would just be uh, a circle that's, that's constantly going around. Um, a nice way to think about both of these, to think about e to the i 2 pi ft, so to think about a, uh, a complex sinusoid like this, is to think about the time coming out of the board as a third dimension. So we have our x and our y, and imagine that time is the z direction. Instead of having a point go around in the xy plane, if the point spirals around in time, as time advances, the spiral would come out of the board. And so uh, positive frequency would spiral around in one direction, and negative frequency would spiral around in the other direction as, as a function of time. All right, so let's see how all of this shows up in the new radio. So let me share my screen again. And I have new radio up here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give this flow graph a title. I call it complex plot. Complex plot. And I'm going to set the sample rate. Um, since this is a simulation, sample rate doesn't matter too much, but it's nice to make it an even number, like 100 kilohertz, 100 E3. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to make this complex sinusoid. And the way I do that is I uh, lay down a signal source. So in core waveform, where is it? Waveform generators. Yes. Ah, there we go. Okay. That, something weird is happening. Let me do my control F trick where I just type signal, signal source under waveform generators. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so this is a source. So it has nothing coming in except these gray boxes, which are kind of optional uh, control controls. And what comes out is going to be this complex sinusoid. And I would say that this is one of the, one of the cases where the, uh, the notation here in GNU Radio is a little bit confusing. So if I, right-click and go to properties here, 
the output type I can choose to be complex or real, complex or float, or int or short or byte, any of these. Uh, we're going to stick with complex or float. If you set it to be a real number, you set it to be float, then this waveform, these waveform options make a lot of sense. You can either choose a constant, a sine, a cosine, a square wave, a triangle wave, a sawtooth wave. If you choose the output type to be complex, which is the default, cosine actually outputs this complex exponential. So in the real part, it will output the cosine. In the imaginary part of this output, it will output the sine. And we'll see that in a second when we plot it. Um, I would say it's a little bit not non-intuitive. Um, frequency, by default, it's 1,000. Let's actually make this a variable. Or let, I'll actually make it a slider here. So let me do freak. Frequency, amplitude of 1, that's fine. Uh, offset, phase, all the rest of the stuff is fine. So I need to define this variable frequency. So let me choose, uh, let me search for range here. So under GUI widgets, QT, QT GUI range, if I drag this over, um, I can make a slider for this variable frequency, freak. So let me call that freak, F-R-E-Q. Um, and I want to show both positive and negative frequencies. So I'll make the default value one, say, one hertz. And I will start the range at minus 100 kilohertz and stop the range at plus 100 kilohertz and a step size of one, oops, E3, step size of one kilohertz, that's, that's probably fine. Um, because this is a simulation, I have to do something that I never have to do when I have real hardware. And in fact, I shouldn't do when I have real hardware. And that is to put down a throttle block. So let me just search for throttle. So all this does is it just tells the computer to artificially throttle this data stream. Because remember in, in GNU radio, all of the timing is set by the hardware sources. The, the RTL is our typical source. And when we did the FM receiver, the sound card in your computer was the sync. And when I connect these streams here, the streams carry no metadata information. They are just one complex number after another. All the metadata in terms of sample rates and frequencies and everything else, that has to be kept track of separately. And so this throttle block uh, queues up data from the signal source and only lets it out at, at the rate you specify. Otherwise, the sample rate has, has no meaning in this flow graph other than kind of default parameters of, of several blocks, which, which you can see. You know, the default parameter of the signal source was already set to sample rate, but uh, I, that's only, uh, I could change that to be whatever I want. So the reason why you do not want a throttle block if you have a real hardware source is, say you, you had your sample rate of 100 kilohertz and you told your RTL SDR to output data at 100 kilohertz, if your computer clock wasn't exactly in sync with the RTL's clock, then eventually this throttle block might uh, accumulate lots of samples coming from the hardware and overflow, or it might underflow if, if it was spitting out samples too quickly. So you only want a throttle block in a simulation. All right, so, and you only need one throttle block. It doesn't have to be attached to a signal source. It can actually be anywhere in the, in the flow graph. All right, so now, Whenever I do anything, I want to plot it, and so let me plot it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to um, instrumentation, and the arrow is not working, so I'm gonna find it. So time. Uh, let me actually, let me do QT, QT GUI. All right. So here are all my instrumentations. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot this as a function of time by putting down a QT GUI time sync. I'm going to plot it as a function of frequency by putting down the QT GUI frequency sync. They're all things I've done before. And the new thing is I'm going to plot it on the complex plane by putting down a QT GUI constellation sync. So I'll look at all three of these type of plots. And the default parameters are fine. It'll plot 1,024 uh, time points. It'll plot 1,024 frequency bins. And it'll plot 1,024. Uh, uh, points on the complex plane. So let me play this. 
I need to save it. Complex plot, save, run. I'll expand it out a little bit. And I have it running at one hertz. So what you should see, and let me know if, if uh, you actually do see it, let me shrink this a little bit. You should see a point going around in the complex plane down here. This is the constellation plot. And it should be looping around at one hertz. So every second, the point should return to where it is. And there's actually 1,024 points all clustered in this one little point. And I can see that if I increase, increase the speed here. So in my time plot, I'm only plotting 1,024 points. And that's not nearly a second's worth of points. So I don't, I don't get a full sine wave's worth of stuff. So if I increase the frequency here, 2 hertz, 3 hertz, 4 hertz, as I go up, you can see more and more points on the complex plane, and more and more of this sine wave gets filled in. So eventually, I'll go to 90 hertz, 100 hertz. And now I'm starting to see my real part and my imaginary part coming in. So let me actually lock it to exactly 100 hertz here. And let me pause this top plot by middle clicking and saying stop. And you can see that I get a full period of the real part and a full period of the imaginary part. And here is where you can think of the, the cosine as starting here. And this is a positive frequency, positive 100. So the cosine starts up and goes down, and the sine starts at 0 and goes up. And then it just repeats over and over again. So let me, let me play. If I were to go to negative frequencies, let me do that. Let me start at minus one hertz. So at minus one hertz, the cluster of dots is moving in the opposite direction on the complex plane. So my cluster of uh, 1,024 dots is moving in the opposite direction. And I see slowly varying stuff. Let me go down to minus 100 hertz. And I will stop it. Um, here is where my real parts, my cosine peaks. And if I look here, the imaginary part, the sine part, doesn't go up anymore. It goes down. So this is how I know I have a negative complex exponential frequency. So let me play that some more. And I can decrease the frequency or increase the frequency. And if I'm, uh, let's say I'm 1,024, if I happen to be a multiple of, uh, of what's down here, I, I fill in this plot nicely. But at certain other points, I happen to be sampling much less frequently. And you can see that you know, at other points, I'll, I'll uh, fill in some random, random set of points there. And the frequency plot just shows me the frequency spectrum of this. And if I look at where the peak is, so let me set this to 10,000. 10, if I mouse over where the peak is, it should be at about yeah, 10.0-ish 10, 10 kilohertz. I guess I don't have the resolution here. Let me zoom in a little bit. There we go, about 10.0 kilohertz is where the frequency is. If I go to minus 10,000, um, I'm getting some smattering of points here that's, that's not filling the unit circle because the samples are, are repeating. And the frequency peak is at minus 10,000. So we'll talk a little bit more about sampling in a future lecture, but I just want to give you uh, a preview that uh, you have to be a little bit careful about uh, interpreting some of these plots when you're sampling a continuous distribution. All right, so that is that is all I have to say about complex numbers in software-defined radio. Uh, I'm going to give you a few pieces of homework to do. And homework number one is to look at a real cosine signal. So take that flow graph, take the, the cosine that's coming out. And I'll say the simplest way to start homework number one is to add its complex conjugate. So there's a complex conjugate block that you can find and an add block that you can find to add two streams. And if you have a complex number, a plus ib, and you add its complex conjugate, a minus ib, you'll end up with 
two times the real part. So if you start out with e to the i 2 pi f t, its real part is cosine, its imaginary part is sine. If you add the complex conjugate of this stream, you end up with two cosine uh, in the real part and no imaginary part. And if you just plot that, uh, you, you, will, you will see a couple of features. Um, first of all, in the time plot, you should only see a real part and no imaginary part. What I want you to look out for is in the constellation part, it should only be a real number. And so the point should just move back and forth along the real axis. And since it's a cosine, it shouldn't matter whether the frequency is positive or negative. You should get the same, same pattern. If you're projecting things onto the real axis, you're, you're just going to get a, a sloshing back and forth no matter what. And the other thing to keep in mind is looking at the frequency plot there. Uh, let me erase this. So you can use Euler's formula, let's say e to the i phi equals cos phi plus i sine phi. If I were to write this as e to the minus i phi, again, I could just plug in for, uh, uh, plug in negative phi for phi. Cosine is an even function. So cosine of negative phi is just cosine phi. Sine of negative phi is just minus sine of phi, so minus i sine of phi. If I were to add these two things together, two cosine of phi, which is kind of what I'm plotting, I'm plotting two, but when I add the real and the imaginary parts of this, I'm plotting two cosine of, uh, of uh, two pi ft, I just get e to the plus i phi plus e to the minus i phi. And so if you have a real cosine, what you actually have is a symmetric combination of positive frequency and negative frequency. So if all I'm keeping is my cosine in, in the homework, uh, my frequency plot should show equal amounts of positive f and minus f. Uh, so that's, that's something to look out for. All right, so homework number two is a lot easier. Um, just examine the other options for waveforms. Examine what square waves and triangle waves and sawtooth waves look like on all three of those plots. Uh, the things to look out for there are, you know, certainly in time, you'll see square waves and triangle waves and sawtooth waves. Uh, and the constellation, you'll see patterns other than circles. And in the frequency plot, you will no longer see a single frequency or a pair of frequencies if you take the, the real part by adding the complex conjugate. You will, you will see the fundamental tone, which is the thing you'll keep continue to set with the slider, but you'll also see a series of harmonics. And uh, that's an important thing we'll, we'll talk about more later. Um, make a note of which harmonics you see. So I, I believe the square wave and the triangle wave have odd harmonics and the sawtooth wave has both odd and even harmonics. That's something to look out for. So that's homework number two. Homework number three is to generate two of those complex exponential signal sources with two different frequencies. So frequency number one, and frequency number two, multiply them together and plot the result. And what you should see is that the new complex exponential is at a frequency that is the sum of the old frequencies. So if I have e to the i 2 pi f1 t, and I multiply that by e to the i 2 pi f2 t, I should get e to the i 2 pi f1 plus f2 t. So I should get a, a single complex exponential, a single complex sinusoid at the sum frequency. And uh, the next homework, homework number four, is just the real version of this. So multiply together two cosines. So cosine of two pi f1 t, cosine of two pi uh, 
f2 t and either with math you can use trig identities to show what this should be but just in GNU radio you can see that what you will get out is not just a cosine with uh, the sum frequency you'll actually get both the sum and the difference in frequencies so that's something you can you can uh, play around with by changing the, the sliders for f1 and f2 and I would recommend making one of these frequencies sort of smallish and one of these frequencies a little bit bigger. If they're both, they're both about the same, and it's a little bit harder to see what's going on. Uh, and finally, the last little homework is uh, take a real cosine. So change that parameter to be real, not complex. I guess you could do that for, for this exercise too. So take a real cosine and plot cosine of two pi f t absolute value of that cosine two pi f t and some nonlinear transformation. So this is certainly a nonlinear transformation, but um, a nice nice transformation to plot is the arc tangent. So a tan of cosine of two pi ft. So what am I getting at here? Well, manipulating signals, and, and we're gonna be focusing on the frequency spectrum here. Manipulating signals changes the frequency spectrum quite a bit. So uh, plotting a cosine, you'll, you'll see a peak at plus frequency and minus frequency. When you take the absolute value, that introduces lots of harmonics. And what is this nonlinear transformation about well, this is sort of simulating an amplifier. So, what does the arc tangent function look like? So, the arc tangent function is pretty linear around the origin, but it's sim simulating a real amplifier that kind of saturates on both its positive and its negative. So, if you have a real amplifier, uh, and you put in a signal, as long as the signal is weak, you tend to get a pretty linear response. But if you overdrive the amplifier, the amplifier can't go above its, its positive and its negative rails. And different amplifiers have different, different ways that they transition. But uh, arctangent is a, is a pretty convenient function. And there's a block that you can use to take a function of a stream. And uh, you can look, at, look for that in the math section. So those are your five homework assignments, and I'll include that in a, in a document. All right, are there any questions about this part?